There's this thing called the Monroe Kelly Doctrine. The skull is hard. Inside the skull, there are three things. Brain matter, blood, and cerebrospinal fluid. If you increase the volume of one of these three components, you're going to displace the other two. Let's say that your patient said a no-no word in a public place after a few drinks, and someone got mad and bashed his head in with a baseball bat and caused the patient to have a traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now he's bleeding into the intracranial space, which is an increase in blood volume, and this causes the brain tissue and the CSF to get compressed and it gets displaced. The brain tissue is just like any other tissue. If it gets injured, it gets inflamed and swollen. Since the skull is hard... There's not really any place the brain can expand and swell, and the pressure inside the skull rises. This is an increase in intracranial pressure, and it's going to screw up cerebral perfusion. As that hemorrhage continues to expand, we know from the Monroe Kelly Doctrine that the brain tissue, NCSF, is going to get displaced. Well, there's only one place for the brain to swell, and that is down through the foramen magnum. The proverbial fly in the ointment with the whole frame and magnum thing is that's where the brainstem is located. And as you know, the brainstem is responsible for the body's vital functions. The brainstem is a twerp. And once it gets encroached on by the brain, it's going to start acting a fool and fucking up the body's vital functions. And this is called herniation. You'll see it manifested by the patient's symptoms, which follow a very clear pattern that has the moniker Cushing's Triad, which they will ask you on every pre-hospital exam you'll ever take. Cushing's Triad consists of a decrease in heart rate, increase in blood pressure, and changes in respiratory pattern. You could see a taxic respirations, it could be chain stokes, it could be kusmals, it could be beats, whatever. It doesn't matter. Just know that the patient's respirations are going to be all jacked up. As the herniation progresses, you will see the patient begin to posture. There are two flavors of posturing, decorticate and decerebrate. Decerebrate indicates worse herniation, but just know that if you see posturing of any kind, it's not good. It's not like, whew, it's just decorticate, we're good. No, the patient is still in bad, bad shape. We want to reduce intracranial pressure, and we do that in the pre-hospital and transport environment by treating the blood pressure and getting it down to around 140 to 160 systolic. You don't want to drop the blood pressure too much. Most programs are now using nicardipine, which is a calcium channel blocker, to do this. But some still use the old labetalol push, which I hate doing because I find that it's erratic. Another topic for another day. The patient will also likely need airway management at this point because they're going to be altered as shit. Also, lame, but raise the head to the stretcher about 30 degrees. Gravity helps, and it's no small thing to do this. And this is mostly a critical care thing, but you may want to dehydrate the brain to reduce swelling. And you accomplish this with mannitol and or hypertonic saline, which is going to draw water out of the brain tissue. Critical things for pre-hospital providers to know is that no matter what, you must avoid hypoxia and hypotension. Even one instance of either of these in the headbanger patient will double mortality. And that's some quick bits on managing the patient with TBI and increased ICP.